Welcome to Theory of Pets. I'm a passionate pet owner with a drive to help others like me uncover the truth about the pet industry and what goes on behind the scenes. Welcome back. Thanks for tuning in. One of my favorite things to read, which probably sounds strange to some of you, is research studies. I am fascinated by the information gathered in different research studies. The most recent study that I read was actually uh, focused on the pet industry. And I wanted to share some of that information with you because I, I just found it really interesting and I thought you guys might like to check it out too. So there is a marketing company. Uh, it's called Big Eye. It's an Orlando-based advertising agency. And they did a study in July and August of 2019 it consisted of a 45 question online survey. They had 784 pet owners answer. The ages of the pet parents ranged from 25 to 55. And they wanted to see how pets influence purchases, devices, and brand appeal. So today I was able to speak with Adrian Tennant, who's the vice president of insights at Big Eye, and he led the research team on this study. So I talked to him, and he uh, is going to tell you guys a little bit about what they found. There's more information on the company's website, and you can download the full study there if you want to read it. I highly recommend it if it's uh, interesting to you. I just find it fascinating how the pet industry has exploded over the last decade or so, um, maybe two decades, and how our pets really do influence the products that we buy and the services that we spend our money on. Um, so if you're interested in it, uh, check out that full study. And uh, Adrian is here today to talk a little bit about it and give us some of the highlights, basically, from the study itself. I'm Adrian Tennant. I'm the Vice President of Insights at Big Eye. We're a audience-focused, a creative-driven, full-service advertising agency based in Orlando, Florida, but we serve clients across the United States and beyond. And recently you've done a really fascinating research study. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so as a full-service advertising agency, Big Eye serves clients obviously active in several industry verticals, um, including pet care, but also direct-to-consumer products, multifamily student and senior living real estate development, uh, and most recently, CBD-based products. So although there is some secondary research available, we really wanted to understand the behaviors and the attitudes that characterize different groups of pet owners. So really that suggested that we needed to undertake our own primary research study. Um, which really kind of gave us the ability to map key decision factors that owners use when they're considering making purchases for their pets. And as a marketing communications firm, we're really interested in learning how pet owners interact with different advertising formats and ultimately what pro prompts pet owners to try new pet products and services. And that's something that I think obviously really speaks to me as a pet owner, but um, obviously thought would be great for our audience because, you know, that's a question that I'm asked so often by people uh, is how do you choose and what, you know, drives pet owners to pick certain things over others? So um, what did you find in your research study? Okay. Well, there's a lot to cover in the, in the complete study, so um, I won't bore you with every single detail. But um, we found that, for example, the percentage of households in the United States that own one or more pets has actually grown from about 56% in 1988 to 67% today. So that's an estimated 85 million households with pets. So consequently, the market for pet products and services has also grown during that period. And that today is worth around $75 billion annually. So it's certainly 
big business. Um, and I think in order to understand what we're buying uh, and how we decide what to buy, we need to understand a little bit about you know who who has what kind of pet. So it probably no surprise to you that 75% of the respondents in our study own dogs, um, and 60% of those dog owners have just that one pet in their home. So it's true that you know that old saying about a dog being a man's best friend, definitely held true. Um, and, uh, of course, we are seeing cats as well and, and small mammals and uh, even some large mammals in the survey. But uh, a, lo- a lot of the pet industry seems to start from a position of dog owners and then kind of reaches out from there. And then, so dog owners, obviously, there's so many different products that we can buy. Um, what did you find about how they're choosing products for their pets? Um, so when we come, when it actually comes to deciding what to feed their pets, forty nine percent, which is almost half of all owners, said that they look to recommendations from their veterinarians. Thirty seven percent told us that they seek advice from friends and family, and about a third of all respondents identified product reviews as strongly influencing their selection. So to your point, we asked what drives pet owners to try new products. Uh, The top answer, 21% of owners told us that coupons, sales, or discounts would drive them to try a new product. Now, to us, yeah, coupons do seem a bit anachronistic, um, but in the digital age, if you think about it, they double as discount codes. And... You know, thinking as a consumer, doing online research, you know, we often include checking for the availability of a discount code, right? Right. So you can see you can see how that works. Um, twenty percent of respondents said that they really are looking for more attribute based uh, features such as nutritional benefits. That can be a key driver as well. Um, Thirteen percent of people were saying that you know review product reviews or friend recommendations will drive them to actually try a new product, and we often forget about it. But samples work really well as well. So if a store is offering you know a free sample of a product, that might actually drive somebody to try it and then buy it. Um, what may be interesting is we did see some generational preferences um, reflecting you know, in the differences in what drives owners to try new products. So the younger the person was responding to our study, so uh, the youngest group we looked at was age 25 to 34, they actually over-indexed for email, commercials, uh, ads, you know, typically online video, and social media mentions. That's, that's what's driving them. But some older consumers, those aged between 35 and 44, were more likely to seek recommendations from friends and family. And the oldest group that we looked at, which were those people, those pet owners aged 45 to 55, significantly over-indexed for coupons or discounts, the nutritional benefit claims, and product samples, as I mentioned before. So there's a little bit of difference there. Yeah, now, that's that's really interesting. And one of the things that stands out to me um, typically, you know, the younger generation, um, they have a lot of them are in school or they're just starting out in their career. They don't have um, the money that to spend that some of the older consumers do. So um, that would make sense to me that they're, you know, looking for those giveaways and um, things on social media, the coupon codes and things like that. Yeah, we did notice, it's interesting, when you ask people to consider their pet purchasing um, habits uh, across you know, different dimensions, we did find that um, in the upper tier of considerations are directly health benefits offered you know, specifically from the product, whether that's in the form of longevity, if it's a toy, or durability. Um, value is a critical factor for everybody. So it's not just necessarily about price, but, you know, what, what is that trade-off between, the, you know, the, the quality of the product, the quantity of the product, and what it's actually doing in terms of the benefit. And then even things like convenience. Um, you mentioned that younger uh, working owner, right, Um, they're probably going to be more inclined to look at a subscription service because they are working, right, so they'll pay a little more for something because it's convenient for them. We found that um, pet owners who subscribe to pet pet 
subscription services, typically you learned about them from a variety of sources, but about a third are finding stuff online, um, while 18% said they'd seen an advertisement and said 14% actually found pet subscription services through word of mouth. Oh, that's interesting. I don't know. I, I've seen advertisements, but I, I have um, not heard much about subscription services from other people. So that's that's interesting. Usually when I see them, it's online. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, it's actually interesting that you mentioned seeing ads. Uh, again, probably no surprise to you, but smartphones have really become the most omnipresent device uh, for seeing ads, as well as doing everything in our lives, right? right so right. if you can think about it, your, your phone is the most available, it's the most convenient, and it's the most immediately available point of access to information. So 38% of our survey respondents told us that that's actually the method they, they prefer to engage with advertisements. 28% um, of our respondents told us that it's television that they're most likely to want to interact with an ad, and about a quarter told us that it was on a laptop or a desktop computer. Um, and there are, again, some significant generational differences in device usage, which I think have an effect on how people respond to advertising. So those owners that are younger than 35 years old, 47% of them are most willing to engage with advertisements using their smartphones, whereas pet owners aged 45 and older lean more towards the TV than the smartphone. And uh, it's also true that we saw a little bit of variation in the areas that people were living in. So whilst the smartphone dominates overall, pet owners in suburban areas were about 12 percentage points less likely than owners in rural areas to engage with advertisements on their phone. And TV is actually the medium least likely to be engaged with by urban pet owners, so those living in like the downtown area, compared to those people in suburban or rural areas. So you know, even the area you live in actually affects the devices that you are tending to respond to when it comes to advertising. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, that I think would also affect your, your shopping habits. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we talked a little bit about the the food um, and what drives people for that. And you guys looked at some other products, too, that pet parents are buying. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first of all, you know, when we when we think about those subscription services that the people that the people are using, um, sixty three percent of people that use a subscription service are doing so for food. And I think, as I mentioned previously, a lot of that has to do with convenience. Because you know, when you buy in bulk, uh, if you've got if you're a multi pet family. Um, that's quite a lot of food, right, that you're having to <laughs> look from the car into the house. So, so I can totally understand that. And I have to say, I've, I've outsourced uh, my pet food deliveries to those nice people at Amazon.com. We but have as there well. Are many, <laughs> many, many other services out there, uh, of which in our survey, Chewy.com was the one that most people uh, seem to be using on a, on a fairly regular basis. But, you know, 48% of people are also subscribing for health products or supplements. Um, 35% of pet owners are actually subscribing for pet treats specifically. And again, it's the younger audience, the 25 to 34 year olds, um, who typically live in a townhome or a condo and are in an urban area. They're actually the ones that are the most likely to subscribe. Um, okay, so, so, so some surprising things for me. Okay, so I'm, I must confess I'm a cat owner. Uh, I have two Maine Coons. Uh, beautiful cats. Um, so this is not me. I don't buy costumes for my cats, but I might be <laughs> an exception <laughs> to the rule. And it might be a generational thing, honestly, because we found that th about a third of all pet owners um, at least sometimes purchase costumes for their pets. Um, now, this practice is actually most widespread, once again, amongst those y younger pet owners aged 25 to 34 who have two or more pets. They tend to be dog owners, right? They also, interestingly, tend to live in either apartments, townhomes, or condos in urban areas. Female and male owners are actually equally likely to purchase costumes. Oh, that's and interesting. 
right? And 11% of dog owners purchase apparel frequently. Like, not just sometimes, but actually frequently. So it makes, a mind, makes my mind boggle um, whether they have, like, a separate pet closet for all this apparel. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on there, but it's super interesting. Anyway, interesting. I think it, I think it reflects um, you know the millennial generation's engagement with social media and probably Instagram in particular. So yeah. it's not too difficult to find videos of owners taking their pets right to the specialty retailers and actually filming them, filming their pets. They try on different costumes. And, um, you know, and taking the photos, like you said, especially Instagram, when you take photos of your pet in a different costume or, you know, with a funny hat or a big bow or something like that, and you, you post it for your followers. Yeah, and, there's, you know, there's, this is almost like a popular category in its own right. Um, I don't know if any of your listeners are also into the newest social entertainment platform, TikTok, um, but it's very easy to find lots of hilarious pet costume videos on TikTok. So sure. Just a, yeah, very, what a time waster, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get Super sucked in. <laughs> you, you can't stop watching. Um, yeah, and I think interesting to me too is that um, you see more people doing that in the urban areas. We live in Maine in a very rural area. And so if I did dress my dogs in costumes regularly, we would really be the only people that would see that, you know, aside from maybe friends or family that stop over for a visit. But for the most part, our dogs, we have a lot of property, so they don't go to a dog park. We don't go for walks down the sidewalk or anything like that. Um, but if you live in the more urban areas and your dog is out and about more, you know, I'm sure people like the attention and the, the compliments from people seeing their pet dressed up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Sam, I do have um, some stats for you if you want to ask me anything about um, CBD, because uh, I know you've covered cannabidiol in a previous podcast, so I do yes. have some stats on that. Yeah, yeah, and for anybody that follows um, my podcast or my writing, they know that I have used CBD with uh, our dogs for uh, a number of reasons over the years, um, and it's something that I think it's still quite controversial, but it's something that definitely there's been more light shown on recently about the health benefits. Um, so you guys looked into that, and what did you find about CBD in the pet industry? Yeah, so... We found that CBD is currently administered by 17% of all pet owners. Um, now, for dog owners specifically, it's a little higher than that. It's actually 20%. So one-fifth of all dog owners are currently administering CBD. 44% of dog owners don't currently use CBD-infused products, but would consider doing so for their pet in the future. And about a fifth of dog owners, 21%, are holdouts. Um, you know, they're not interested. And 15%, honestly, are just kind of unsure. And I think that reflects perhaps still some uncertainty in the market about just what CBD is, um, pros, cons, concerns. As you know, it's sort of a bit of a wild, wild west situation at the moment with regards to CBD regulations. Uh, every state is different. Um, but the responses also suggest to us that interest in CBD is not confined, you know, to states where cannabis products are legalized. There's really significant interest across the U.S. Um, pet owners currently using CBD products are much more likely than non-users to have health insurance for their pets. You know, that surprised us. 56% of those currently using CBD have insurance compared with just 25% of all the owners um, that responded to our survey. And, you know, pet owners have definitely seen many potential uses for CBD. Um, our survey suggests that the dominant CBD indication is as an anxiety and stress reducer, and 43% of all pet owners are cut, that, that said they were using CBD are currently administering CBD for that specific purpose. But 37% of owners open to its use would also use it for that. 16% of owners, users and non-users, um, either currently use or would consider using CBD to treat nausea. 15% said they would use it for seizures. 13% suggested they would use it to treat cancer symptoms. And 9% told us that they would use it to treat gastrointestinal or digestive issues in their pets. So 
huge amount of interest in, in CBD and we're really interested to see where this goes ultimately. Absolutely. And that's a topic that I followed as well. Um, and one of the things that I think is going to play a part in that uh, is veterinarians. And, you know, now we're seeing more and more veterinarians, especially the holistic veterinarians, getting on board um, and recommending it to their customers. And as you mentioned with uh, the dog food uh, just a little while ago, you know, a lot of pet parents reach out to their vets for recommendations. And uh, if your veterinarian is more uh, into recommending prescription medications or over-the-counter medications, um, you know, you're probably not going to be interested in trying the CBD if the expert that you work with doesn't recommend that. That's right. You know, yeah. um, we did mention that veterinar veterinarians are a key source of recommendations. And about 36% of our respondents also told us that veterinary care tops the kind of categories of pet services that they regularly use. We did find that about 25% of our respondents are using some kind of grooming service for their pets. And I'm thinking, obviously, very specifically around dogs. Um, about 14% are using either a pet sitter or a feeder and walkers. Um, and it's about the same as boarding and daycare. So, um, you know, there's, there's quite, a, quite a variety of services that are being um, availed on a fairly regular basis. Um, but if you think about, you know, what people are actually spending, um, we found that it's comparable across most segments. So overall, 76% of pet owners are spending less than $100 per month on pet items. Um, but for 45% of owners, this adds up to between $600 and $1,200 per year. But 19% of pet owners actually spend double that rate. So they're up to $2,400 annually. So you can see where that $75 billion a year comes from. <laughs> yeah, for right. sure. And were those statistics, was that per animal or was that um, it would vary depending on how many animals they have? Yeah, that, that was the average. That was the average across the board. Oh, okay. So obviously people with multiple pets are going to be spending more so than, you know, <laughs> owners with just one. That's right. Yes, I think that's fair. But it's also true that um, when we looked at the dog, like the dog owners separately, um, about 28% of all dog owners spend up to $50 per month. 48% uh, are spending between $51 and $100 per month. 21% of dog owners spend between $101 and $200 per month. And the uh, top 5% spend more than $200 per month. So if you're a dog, it pays to be in the top five. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yeah. In terms of where, in terms of where people are shopping, you know, we found that um, those retailers that offer both in-store and online, um, it was always the in-store purchases that seemed to be outpacing online. Um, individually, Walmart actually topped the list. Sixty-six percent. Really? Wow. Of yeah, 66% of our survey respondents said they shopped for pet products there in the past year. Um, PetSmart, 62%. Uh, Petco was at 56%. And 44% of all respondents said that they purchased from Chewy.com. Um, almost half of all pet owners actually purchased pet food from either a grocery or a department store, hmm. and it's about seven. Yeah, it's about seventeen percent of pet food purchases are made online. Wow, I thought that number would be higher. I I did expect that to be higher. Hmm. Yeah, just goes to show, right? So yeah, absolutely. People are still very, still prepared to go and physically buy the food and bring it home. Yeah. So these numbers and this these statistics, after you've done the study and you've compiled all the numbers, then what do you do with this information? How does it go out and help pet owners, consumers, um, producers, and, and uh, companies? Um, well, that, that's a great question, and I appreciate you asking it. We, we hope 
that everybody that reads the report or at least reads a summary of the report or listens to us talking about the report uh, will find something of interest in it and be able to apply it to their own either business or life or if they're working with animals uh, that this will help inform them on maybe some areas that they need to be looking at so for example if you're in the business of providing grooming services uh, maybe that information about CBD is useful to you um, similarly, as a as a pet owner, you might be just interested to learn how other people are buying things for their animals and what decisions they they use. Um, we talked a little bit about specifically which retailers. There's actually a lot more information in the full report, which is available from our website for free, so anybody can download it from our website. Um, uh, you know, if you're if you're a company that produces a product for pets, or even thinking about developing one, hopefully the information in the report gives you an idea of where you might find particular audiences for those products and whether it makes sense to advertise online, advertise on TV, on the radio, or on a podcast, just like the one we're on right now. And for anybody that does want more information, if you want to look at that full report or um, see anything, any information about what we're talking about today, there is a link below the podcast. You can go to the website um, and check that out. There's a lot of great stuff there. Obviously, we don't have time to cover everything today, um, but uh, we, you've hit the highlights and there's so much more information on the website. So if anybody's interested in that, um, they can click and check that out. Thank you very much. And do we you guys that. have any plans for future um, surveys in the pet industry? Is this something you might do yearly or every few years? Yeah, we've actually had a great response to this. This is the first time that we had a produced report like this. We've had a great response to it. So I think based on the interest that's been shown, it is something that we're going to do again. We might tweak um, some of the questions, honestly, for the, for the next release. And there's so many different areas in the world of pet care and pet care marketing. Um, any one of them could almost spawn its own service. So I mentioned, you know, the fact that 36% um, of owners are purchasing costumes. That's a really interesting topic in its own right. So you might see us going down, no pun intended, several rabbit holes <laughs> for, the next, <laughs> for the next report. <laughs> Oh, that's exciting. And I, I will certainly follow uh, the website. And I, I'd love to chat with you again uh, in the future to talk about this. And obviously, with every aspect of the market, I think we could say this, but certainly with the pet industry, you know, there's new things popping up every day. One of the major things you talked about today was subscription services, which didn't exist 10 years ago. So uh, it'll be interesting as you go along to see the new trends that come and, and how people are, um, you know, switching their buying habits over time. Absolutely. Yeah, well, Sam, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me on. I really appreciate it. A huge thank you to Adrian for being on the program today. I love having experts from the industry to come and talk to us and answer our questions. And of course, uh, you know, discuss some of the things that I'm interested in as well so I can educate other pet owners around the world that may um, be interested in the same topic. So again, if you guys have any questions about the study itself, just click the link below this podcast and that will take you to the full study and all of that research and information. Um, if you guys want so, to hear some more podcasts, if you're looking for more information on pet parenting or the pet industry in general, feel free to jump on our website, theoryofpets.com. If you have any questions, burning questions that you've been dying to get answered or you'd like to see uh, a podcast on a specific topic, feel free to leave your um, recommendations there for future podcasts. I always look at those and try to get the information that you guys are looking for as well. And if you could leave me a quick review when you are on our site or if you're listening through iTunes or another streaming service, uh, leave a quick review. That helps me when I'm reaching out to experts in the industry. I can let them know that you guys are out there listening and you want to hear more. So thanks for tuning in today, guys. I'll be back with another hot topic very soon.